Welcome to the Dispatch Podcast. I'm Jamie Weinstein. My guest today is Nicholas Eberstadt. He is the Henry Wendt Chair in Political Economy at the American Enterprise Institute and an expert on North Korea, which is why I have him on today to discuss a recent and alarming article that appeared in January by two uh, scholars and practitioners, let's say, of diplomacy in North Korea, uh, that they believe North Korea has made a decision to go to war. So I brought Dr. Eberstadt on uh, to talk through this and whether he has the same interpretation of recent events in North Korea as the two writers of that piece do. And we get into other issues surrounding North Korea, uh, what they think about the upcoming 2024 election or what they might be concerned about, and what the future of this conflict will be if he doesn't buy the idea that we are on the brink of war. Uh, I think you'll find this episode informative and necessary. Without further ado, I give you Dr. Eberstein. Nicholas Eberstein, welcome to the Dispatch Podcast. Thanks for inviting me. I wanted to have you on because of what was a somewhat alarming article uh, that came out in January. And as a North Korean expert, an expert uh, who's been following the situation in North Korea versus South Korea for, for a long time, I hope you could provide some insight in, into what your thoughts on this article was. And I just want to begin by reading uh, two graphs of it. This was an article written by Robert Carlin and Siegfried Hecker in 38north.com. You may know them. I don't. They are North Korean watchers, experts, what have you. And the article is, it starts with a question mark. Has North Korea made a decision to go to war? And uh, the opening graph uh, says, the situation on the Korean Peninsula is more dangerous than it has been at any time since early June 1950. That may sound overly dramatic, but we believe, like his grandfather in 1950, Kim Jong-un has made this, a strategic decision to go to war. They go on at the very end of the article, and they write, North Korea has a larger nuclear arsenal by our estimates of potentially 50 or 60 warheads deliverable on missiles that can reach all of South Korea, virtually all of Japan, including Okinawa and Guam. If, as we suspect, Kim has convinced himself that after decades of trying, there is no way to engage the United States, his recent words and actions paint towards the prospects of a military solution using that arsenal. Dr. Eberstadt, what do you make of this article? Is, is there something new that has gone on here? And should we be as alarmed as this article suggests we should be? I would say something new has gone on, and I'd say we don't need to be as alarmed as this article seems to be. The, uh, the authors of the article, Bob Carlin and Sig Hecker, are uh, very well-regarded experts in their area. Bob Carlin uh, is an uh, intelligence community analyst uh, following North Korean affairs for decades, following it very carefully. Sig Hecker, the uh, nuclear expert, former head of Los Alamos. The two of them have been involved in Stanford University's programs on North Korea for many, many years. They visited North Korea under that aegis, under the uh, aegis of Bill Perry's work there. They ironically have been known in the past for being uh, optimists or maybe even uh, doves on, uh, on North Korean questions seeing uh, reforms that uh, other people would say haven't happened and didn't happen, seeing prospects for getting to yes with North Korea that some of the rest of us didn't think were there. Now they've swung much in a more alarmed way towards seeing war just around the corner. Maybe they will turn out to be right and to be the geniuses uh, in the uh, strategic equivalent of the big short. But I would say that there are things that they are pointing to that are, that are real, but that may not be proof that the red balloon is going up. What they talk about in, uh, in their essay is an interesting and I think important change in North Korea's ideological doctrine for decades, for generations, in fact, the North Korean regime has insisted that the South was part of uh, their Korean realm, that their founding documents 
talk about the uh, about one Korea and about the need for a uh, revolution in the South for full unification to come to fruition and full reunification being, of course, uh, the absorption of South Korea unconditionally into the DPRK run by that lovely Kim family in Pyongyang. What's unfolded in the last month or so is a very public renunciation of this longstanding doctrine on unification. Kim Jong-un very publicly said, it is now as a practical matter impossible to imagine unification with the South. We in the North and those in the South are too different to think that anything like this could really be practicable. But if these puppets and uh, this, these despicable people in the South should ever threaten us, we will conquer them, we will fight them, we will beat them, we will conquer them, we will annex them. You might say, in a way, we now have a sort of a distinction without a difference. Whereas Grandpa, had, Kim, Kim Il-sung, had a doctrine of unification, which was kind of unconditional unification under North Korean Kim family rule, grandson is talking about uh, absorption by conquest and annexation. The question that came up in this article is whether this was a sign that something big was about to happen. It may turn out that Bob and Sig end up looking like prophetic geniuses in the future because of a tragedy, a tragic miscalculation that Kim Jong-un initiates. But so far, uh, despite everything, Kim Jong-un has shown quite a good knack for survival. Is it possible to read what you just said as less bellicose? And let me explain, just listening to to your explanation, if they they no longer believe that the peninsula needs to be united because they are the same and the Kim Jong family, the Kim family needs to rule all Koreans, North and South, uh, and that they're too different to to for this to occur, doesn't that allow them to exist in their, you know, uh, oppressive state without uh, leading to the, the need to, to reunify the South and thus cause a great calamity, a great war? Jamie, you've asked a terribly important question, and there's a lot of prognostication about this in South Korea in particular. South Korea is a very polarized society, just as the U.S. is polarized. If you can imagine it, it's even more polarized than the U.S. is. And people on the South Korean left, the so-called sunshine uh, contingents, who've been hoping it would be possible to have a rapprochement or a detente with Pyongyang for a generation and more, they've been looking at that change in language and hoping that it means that the North is recognizing the possibility for a condominium of the two states, that not just that the states cannot unify, but that they can coexist in peace. That's the hope. What seems to be a little bit awkward for that interpretation is the sort of 1943 or 1944 level of total war mobilization in the North with all of those forces uh, forward deployed towards the South and the ongoing development of the weapons of mass destruction by the North Korean state. It was one thing when the North Korean state was working on um, their, uh, what President Trump called their little rocket man uh, projects, looking to uh, knock on uh, the door of President Trump or his successors with a a ballistic missile tipped with a nuclear warhead. But in the years since then, the North Korean government has been working on uh, perfecting short-term, shorter-range nuclear weaponry. 
the sorts of things that you would be using if you wanted to fight and win a limited nuclear war in the Korean Peninsula or in the Korean Peninsula and the surrounding areas. By all of the allocations of government resources and the race, uh, you know, race towards technology that the North Korean government has been engaged in at the same time, this doesn't look as if they're getting ready for a porcupine strategy. One more question about the article, kind of one of the assumptions that underpins it seems to be that the North was genuinely trying to come to some sort of agreement with the United States and the West, and the West uh, failed to provide what North Korea needed, and therefore now Kim Jong-un has been rebuffed, and he is now angry uh, and uh, is is turning more bellicose. Uh, what do you make, I mean, do you, do you read that assumption into this piece, and, and what do you make, uh, if you do, of that assumption? I have very high regard for uh, Bob Carlin, the North Korean affairs analyst. Sig is more of a scientist and nuclear person. And I'm always interested by what he has has to write. I don't think I will be revealing state secrets to say that uh, Bob and I are almost always in a friendly disagreement about interpretations. The images that come to mind when I hear that uh, are previous uh, interpretations that other people had in the past, not Bob. These are different people about how uh, Fidel Castro had wanted to be a friend of the United States, but then we were just like a little bit rude, so he had to become a Soviet satellite. Or uh, Ho Chi Minh was really just, it was a patriot, and if only we had understood his uh, inherent nationalism, we never would have had the problems with uh, Viet Minh and then the Viet Cong that uh, distracted us for a little while. North Korean objectives were, you know, for three full Kims have been pretty well concentrated upon the argument that Pyongyang is the one and only legitimate power in the Korean peninsula, and that the monstrosity that's developed in the South, which by some happenstance has become a very prosperous democracy, is an illegitimate cancer on the face of the earth. And... um, we are we may be beyond the sort of the uh, poles of pre-modern history in such a way that these uh, kind of calls are a little bit we're a little bit deaf to them, but the idea which has been central to North Korean propaganda that uh, it is imperative to protect and gather the race which is being preyed upon by other enemy races in the neighborhood, and that the Kim family is going to be the vehicle for bringing the Korean race to a safe harbor and to future glory and also a little bit of revenge against those bad races, that falls a little clunky on our ears. There are other, uh, other places where that hum in the blood may be a little bit stronger. The argument that unification is worth even the horrible impoverishment which the subjects of the Kim family regime have suffered, that this is a sacrifice which we are making for a glorious future. This seems bizarre to us, but it may not be bizarre to some other people. And I think that if you made a version of it back in Homeric Greece, it wouldn't have been bizarre to a lot of people back then. Let me ask you questions outside of the piece uh, about North Korea. It seems every time there is some type of negotiation, a new administration comes in to handle North Korea, the strategy seemingly always involves trying to get China to to help make the situation better by preventing uh, China using their leverage and power to stop uh, Kim Jong-un from, from being as bellicose as he is. How much control does China have over North Korea, even if they wanted to uh, cooperate with us? Do they have that amount of control? Could they remove Kim Jong-un if they wanted to without uh, much difficulty? What, what is their precise power over North Korea? Well, this is, a, this is obviously a matter of uncertainty. If people in the United States understood this a little bit better, 
we probably wouldn't be having the endless speculation about this question that we've been engaged in for the last 30 plus years uh, for this entire period of the long North Korean uh, nuclear drama. I'll give you an interpretation because I don't know uh, I don't know the answer myself. My impression is that uh, the Chinese government's approach to North Korea is kind of like what your approach or my approach would be if we lived in the apartment next to Joey Gallo and he had nuclear weapons. I think you'd probably be a little bit scared of him, and you certainly wouldn't want to have trouble with him. If Joey Gallo could be trained on some of your enemies, then you might even be okay with him doing some bad things to you as long as he was doing hurting your enemies more. And as best I can make out, that's the sort of the peculiar calculus that the uh, CCP is uh, engaging in in its dealings with North Korea. It's, it does not want, to, this is my interpretation, I cannot prove this. My interpretation is, it is the CCP is fine with having strategic depth in the form of a divided Korean peninsula and this buffer, so to speak, of uh, DPRK. You know, they had a little kind of like unpleasant experience with people from Japan kind of trudging across the Korean peninsula into Manchuria a while ago, and I don't think they liked it too much. And they're willing to subsidize that strategic depth to some degree, as long as the North Korean state is causing more uh, heartache and trouble to the U.S. and the U.S. alliance than to the CCP. That seems to be an acceptable state of affairs. Uh, How people in Washington became so sophisticated that they came to the conclusion that the Chinese government would want to help the United States in dealing with the North Korean problem is is really kind of hard for me to answer because I think you just have to be really sophisticated to come to a crazy conclusion like that. Well, well, here's another question, which I'm sure there's not a precise answer because a lot of what we know about North Korea is sometimes difficult to to actually know. Um, Do you believe Kim Jong-un is rational? It's possible to act in perfectly rational ways and to be a a rather unpleasant person and to have rather unpleasant objectives, I think. The greatest evidence that that he is rational to me would be the fact that so far as I know, he's not in a pine box today. And he came into power Uh, into supreme power, maybe, but into power in North Korea uh, 12, 13 years ago, inheriting not a terribly good legacy from his uh, awful father, Kim Jong-il, who was not only a uh, terribly wicked man, but also a very bad emperor who had um, destroyed the North Korean economy, largely, as far as we can tell, destroyed the party apparatus, run down the state administration, all of the sorts of things you're not supposed to do if you're kind of like in the dynastic succession business. Against very long odds, Kim Jong-un restored the North Korean economy uh, a bit, albeit from a very low base. He rebuilt the party apparatus. He got the state administrative uh, function more back towards uh, the sort of capabilities a dictator would like to have. And then, of course, things, um, things have gone in a kind of a peculiar direction since the nuclear drama of 2017 and COVID and uh, now this new a quadrangle of Tehran and uh, Beijing and Moscow and Pyongyang. Considering what he inherited, I'd say that uh, I'd say that the little fellow has played his hand pretty well. Not that I like that, not much like what he does, uh, as you may appreciate. But 
you have to give him credit for what he has accomplished given his you know given his lights and i mean he's he's running the most effective outdoor uh prison camp in the world he is maintaining an absolutely outsized global threat put it global influence compared to uh, his level of uh, national economic capability. And nobody's put a, you know, nobody's put a bullet in his head. So I would say all things considered, he looks like, uh, he looks like a pretty rational guy. Uh, you know, he's, he's having a better run than Al Capone did. Can I ask you this? Um, you you famously wrote a book in uh, called The End of North Korea. Are you surprised that it's lasted that you're that we're talking about it uh, almost I think twenty five years after the book was published that North Korea is still in place? I'm completely surprised, and I think among other things, I um, I have been uh, educated by what I see as the tragic continuation of the world's uh, most oppressive dictatorship these past decades. Part of what I think I didn't understand when I wrote that analysis, some of the aspects of resilience in the North Korean totalitarian apparatus. You have to remember that the people in North Korea are Koreans. We have contact with Koreans and not North Koreans. The Koreans we know uh, in our own lives are pretty smart uh, pretty entrepreneurial, pretty hardworking, often very creative. Take those same talents and put it to developing a survivable uh, totalitarian dynastic dictatorship. And I think you can understand, as I should have, some of the ways that creative dictators could take a Stalin-style system and customize it to kind of Korean specifications to make the make it more survivable. That's one part. The other part, and I didn't have enough imagination to think of such a thing because it would have seemed to me like you know going out into deep science fiction land. Uh, I didn't have enough imagination to conceive of a world in which the South Korean state, which is be, being threatened for its very life by the North Korean neighbors would want to rescue financially the North Korean state from its deep economic crisis. And so in the late 1990s, we saw first the South Korean state and then the U.S. state and then the state of Japan band together to provide the economic lifeline to North Korea to allow it to avoid economic complete economic collapse, complete breakdown of its um, a division of labor domestically. I don't think we will know until we get our hands on the archives in Pyongyang, as I assume we will eventually do, just how close North Korea came to complete collapse before the West rescued the place financially. But I think that would be interesting to learn. Well, I guess my, my final question on, on North Korea would just be, where will we be 25 years? How does this game end in a certain way? Obviously, war is so horrible to, you know, hopefully we never see it. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, maybe the much worse case in all the scenarios and every other conflict that we we're discussing right now, it seems to me, um, millions potentially dead. Uh, but the stability of North Korea st- still, still, as you said, may be stronger now than it was 25 years ago. How do you foresee um, the end of North Korea? Jamie, to you and to me and to anybody who listens to us and to a lot of people who won't listen to us, the idea that you'd put two cats in a bag and one of them would be called North Korea and one of them would be called South Korea, at the end of the, you know, I'm skittering in the bag, the one that comes out alive is North Korea. That'd sound absolutely preposterous to us. North Korea's got a tiny population compared to South Korea. It's got a negligible economy compared to South Korea. It doesn't have anything like South Korea's technological prowess. It certainly doesn't have anything like the attractiveness of the South Korean system, at least to 
uh, my sensibility, the notion that a country like that would be able to attack a larger, more affluent, uh, more technologically advanced country and win sounds absolutely preposterous. It doesn't seem to sound preposterous to North Korean leadership if you read what they say. And sometimes it's good to read what people say because sometimes they mean what they say. If you read North Korean pronouncements, and they say that the South is corrupt and pampered and ruined and deracinated, and they clearly seem to believe that the people in the South are gutless and have no will to fight even to save their society. And they may not be wrong. I think they are wrong, but they may not be wrong. It looks to me as if the, uh, the end of U.S. Uh, military alliance with South Korea is regarded as a sort of a precondition for North Korea's game plan of unconditional absorption or annexation of the South. If that's the case, then we have to wonder what it would mean to have an American president who has no interest in the U.S. Uh, ROK alliance. Uh, I can imagine a s scenario that might work out like that. Or alternatively, a South Korean leader who is sufficiently radical or anti-American that he wasn't interested in connections with the U.S. So that's one way that you could get towards what I'm talking about. The other is that there are all sorts of different ways that it's one can imagine that uh, South Korea might be able to collapse under its own, uh, North, North Korea, excuse me, DPRK might be able to collapse under its own weight. We don't know what's going on inside North Korea very well at all. We don't know why uh, the grandson suddenly came out with a doctrine implicitly saying grandpa was wrong about this unification thing all along. There are many in, uh, internal potential fissure lines that we can only see in uh, the rear view mirror if they are ever exposed to us. That may also, uh, that may also give us some sort of uh, eventual insight into the frailties and the weaknesses of an unsustainable regime. I think we have to believe that the gap between North and South is going to continue to widen as long as the North Korean dictatorship has a grip on the subject population of the North. And I hope that the people in South Korea uh, don't give up the dream, the ambition of bringing the two Korean populations back together under a free, democratic, open market society, or I hope with an alliance with the West. I think it's doable. Doctor, I, just because you, you raised it, I think, there, and correct me if I'm wrong, what you were alluding to is that Donald Trump during his first administration did threaten to remove American troops from South Korea unless there was a greater payment from South Korea. Were you alluding to the fear that in a second Trump administration that he might actually do that and that undermining uh, of the defense alliance might give Kim Jong-un at least uh, the, 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 the belief that this alliance is not as strong and therefore a, a chance to attack? If a second Trump administration involved a fraying or a weaken a substantial weakening or an ending of the U.S. ROK military alliance, an awful lot of things could change in Asia. One of the most obvious things which could change in Asia the immediate calculations of the North Korean state with regard to its uh, no longer similar people in the South. But yes, with a more isolationist or mercantile approach to our international relations, I think we can we would, uh, almost invite recalculation by the North Korean dictatorship, but it's not just uh, a President Trump. If we have other uh, populist voices 
having more say, if we have more isolationist uh, tendencies uh, with greater influence in U.S. policymaking, power politics kind of abhors a vacuum. And you, know, you, you don't have to be uh, E.H. Carr to see uh, what might happen in uh, that sort of a prolonged crisis. Sorry, this is the real final question, uh, because I want to follow up on one point there. How much is this discussed in South Korean politics and media? Are they discussing what a future Trump administration may or may not do and and what that could lead to? Oh, of course. Of course. I mean, uh, you could, one can argue that the United States has uh, too much influence, uh, is, is too great and over, uh, you know, an overarching shadow uh, in uh, South Korean political discussions. Maybe, uh, uh, maybe South Korea should have more defensive capabilities of its own. There's a, most of the South Korean public uh, is in favor of, of nuclear weapons in South Korea run by South Koreans right now. <laughs> so they're, uh, and, and, the, and that isn't exactly a new flavor in, uh, in South Korean uh, politics. But uh, you, you, have to, uh, you have to be aware, not just in South Korea and in Europe, but all around the world, one of the uh, big wild cards uh, in trying to assess international political risk is what the United States is going to be doing in the next years. Is the United States is the United States even going to be protecting Pax Americana? And that may not only be a question about Trump. Uh, that may be a question about whoever is elected as a, as a Republican candidate, or for that matter, as the Democratic candidate, because it's not clear that the Democrats are all in on Pax Americana these days either. With that, Dr. Eberstadt, thank you for joining the Dispatch Podcast. <laughs>